Before the market opened on Thursday the 15th of September, UBS Bank announced that it had discovered losses to unauthorised in trading in the range of $2 billion. The loss is amongst the largest ever racked up by an alleged rogue trader. The allegations of fraud and false accounting, the latter going back to 2008, have been made against a trader who worked in the team that dealt with exchange traded funds or ETFs. Today I've got four of our experts from NPA and we'd like to cover what are ETFs, why do traders go bad, what are the signs that can be looked out for, are there lessons that can be learned from other industries and how can these lessons be applied? Rollo, um, exchange traded funds, um, what are they and how risky are they? Well, an exchange-traded fund in itself is, in principle, quite a simple instrument, uh, transparent, and, and, and the risk should be well understood and, 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 and so not too risky. The activities that support that ETF might well involve quite complicated structured trading strategies across a wide range of assets. So there is a potential um, for, for, for market risk and also for operational risk um, in executing and managing those trading strategies, which, which is clearly what we've seen here. So what should have been a relatively high volume business but a low risk business effectively um, has suddenly gone wrong? Yeah, theoretically, managed, managed properly, Delta One should not be a high risk activity for the, for the bank. And as it is an increasingly important driver of profits within a trading division, um, this incident and the, the, the recent incidents at another bank in the, in the, in the same area will be, will be a real worry. Now, Peter, you've been um, working on the trading floor yourself uh, in your past. Um, what, what kind of motivations are there out there to, do, um, uh, to go for these big deals that can suddenly go wrong? Well, trading floors are very pressured places. There's continual <clears throat> performance monitoring, and so the pressure's always there to return the profits. And if you're not doing that, then you're going to get followed very closely. And what could start off as potentially a small slip up. Once you cover that, um, if that grows, then you're on a slippery slope where you're covering up ever larger errors or losses. And ultimately, once you've reached the level relatively early where you've lost your job or your career's over if you get caught, there's really very little to stop you increasing the, the cover-ups that you're making. So, so what went wrong here, for example? You've got um, evidently there's false accounting allegations going back to 2008. So what kind of risk and compliance functions has a bank like UBS got in place that didn't work to spot this? Well, the, the, the first risk has to be a failure of supervision. Mm. Um, his immediate manager um, should have been aware of what he was doing or what he wasn't doing um, if it was a, a lack of something that caused the problems. Uh, and I think the fact that the manager went straight away, presumably fired, um, suggests that that was the conclusion the bank drew as well. Uh, so I think you have to rely on your management structures to know what's happening inside the sections that they're responsible for. I guess you can characterise the risk management approach of most large banks as having three layers where the, the front office, the line managers, take the principal responsibility for knowing the positions that they and their teams have. As Stephen's just said, that seems to have failed in this case. The second line would be the middle office or back office where the risk controls check that the trades that are done have been actually done and booked correctly. That also seems to have failed in this case. And interestingly, the alleged rogue trader's background was from a back office position. So there's a possibility that that had, uh, was a factor in that level failing. And then a final level of internal audit would be unlikely to be looking at the actual detail of the trades but would be more likely looking at the processes and overseeing the first and second lines um, and obviously in this case that seems to have failed as well. Now you mentioned there, um, which is very similar to uh, previous cases, that in this case the, um, the individual came from the back office. Is that is that just a coincidence that um, on other occasions this has happened or is this a...? It remains to be seen in the specific incident as to whether that's a coincidence or not. I suspect that actually that might prove to be to be a relevant factor in looking at how this fraud was able to happen. The thing is, if, the, if, this, if this guy had just put on uh, a directional 
unhedged position uh, sufficiently large to build up a loss of this size, it is highly likely that it would have been detected and would have been visible within within the bank. It is likely that there were the, 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 the fictitious data were introduced into into other systems within the bank in order to mask the size of the exposure that the bank was carrying, and the knowledge to do that and and the, the ability to navigate the relevant the relevant back office systems to do that is something that it's likely this guy this guy might have picked up earlier in his career. That was the pattern seen at, at, at Societe Generale previously. So let's just explore that for a moment. So you've got an ind individual here who knew the back office systems and came into front of them. Um, Stephen, from your experience, what kind of filtering assessments are done on individuals that both come straight into a front office yeah. and also individuals like in this case that actually work their way up from back office into the front office? Is there a difference there? I think there is because um, uh, roles in the back office are usually less um, demanding, um, less risky when you first go into them. And so I think the level of um, due diligence or vetting that the organisation does for people essentially entering clerical type roles is much lower than it would be for professional roles. Um, and they will go through quite extensive checking of people before they go into professional roles. Um, and so there is a risk when you allow people in through the back door to transfer across that, um, that you haven't applied the same due diligence. And it's interesting that uh, Nick Leeson at Bearings, the man who brought Bearings down, um, also entered in through the, the back office. Mm. But I think there are um, some things that banks can do to um, try and find warning signals about people who may be committing frauds. Uh, from my experience, uh, one common factor for most people involved in frauds is that they're in debt. It doesn't mean that all debtors are fraudsters, but experience suggests that a high percentage of fraudsters are debtors. So keeping an eye on people's finances, uh, which banks used to do quite um, diligently in the past, um, is one way of doing that. Another signal is um, that often a fraudster, in order to maintain the fraud, has to be there all the time. And so they're the people who work all the hours, they don't take any holiday, they never have sick leave, they're in the weekends, and they're there to keep all the balls up in the air. And it's when they go away that the balls come crashing down. So some organisations insist that employees take a block of holiday, say two weeks every year, as a way of ensuring that, um, that there is downtime when those balls could come crashing down. And um, at Deutsche Bank, the Peter Young affair, it was when Peter Young was away on holiday that his manager went through his desk and discovered the fraud that he was committing. So there are things that you can look out for. And given that the number of people who are in a position to make a fraud of this kind in the bank is really quite small, probably 100 or less, then actually having a more vigilant approach to those people um, is, is, is entirely feasible. Bill, bring you in here. Um, obviously, you've worked um, in security um, for a number of industries. Um, and uh, what kind of lessons would you suggest should be learned here and the kind of things that could be applied to financial services industry? I think there are broad um, uh, principles that I think are transferable. And um, uh, I think the, uh, the four generic areas that I'd suggest need attention, and this applies to any organization in any industry, uh, start with uh, knowing your assets, applying a thoroughly professional risk-based approach to the assets that really are critically valuable to your business. Then go on to ev everything to do with identity and people, that's the second aspect, uh, which means uh, managing identity very tightly, the access that your people have to all of the assets that you value. And then the third element is, is time. Time is always more important than we think. Uh, and that's both time of uh, people uh, carrying out behavior. Uh, it's a time that by policy you might, uh, for example, uh, allow your administrators to uh, uh, patch your servers. Uh, there are ways in which you can use time and measure time to uh, derive security value from what you observe. Uh, and the fourth element is volume. A volume of, in this case, it might be trades, uh, but it might be uh, a volume uh, of other aspects of behavior uh, that, uh, uh, and some of the examples that Stephen mentioned just now, of people going in at weekends, having a personal pattern that uh, is anomalous, uh, that related to time, but it also related to, um, um, if you like, uh, uh, a level of um, intensity of, act of activity, and it would be interesting to know 
exactly how that uh, uh, showed itself in terms of clusters of behavior. Um, you brought all, all of those four elements together, and then you see what are the elements that go out of the normal uh, um, uh, medium, if you like, uh, which can be applied to teams, it can be applied to individuals, um, and then you look at the clusters and you find that, ah, there is something here that's different about this individual. It doesn't mean to say at all that they're guilty of anything. It is to say that there's something that uh, probably suggests there's potentially a higher risk that needs to be recognised there, and a closer look taken. So we've talked about um, here both the, um, the vetting of an individual as well. Um, I think, Peter, you said, uh, uh, Stephen, you said there was uh, not that many people in a bank um, that actually um, could cause um, uh, this degree uh, of fraud um, I think, um, within the hundreds, certainly, in a, in a bank like UBS. So we've talked about certainly the vetting of them. And then, Bill, you've been talking about the un um, detecting patterns and everything else um, around an individual or a team um, to detect these kind of things. Um, Rollo and Peter, are there any of those systems already in place from your experience um, uh, on, the, on traditional risk and compliance functions in an investment bank? A number of those items are things that are already monitored. So the point around people, people taking holiday, etc. These points have been assimilated by by many or most institutions in the city. But I think looking, um, I, mean, I mean, Peter, by all means, jump in. I think I think looking at some of these more more um, detailed, more involved indicators is an area in which, in which further investment might be necessary. I think the systems and processes, if, if used effectively and, and, and the processes followed effectively, are there to present this kind of stuff, but it's probably the human factor that's, 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 that's letting institutions down. I, mean. oh, I absolutely agree. I think perhaps I'd characterise it as looking at the first level checks in most banks are already there. So there are standard checks on whether you're permissions are correct within the systems and what people are doing. But there's room for a second level of um, using a hard degree of creativity in interpreting the vast amount of data that's available. Mm. So you can build up a pattern of people's behaviours over time. For example, which portfolios they're putting trades in or the number of amendments they're making. The irony, the irony is that if any institutions in the world are capable of crunching the data and carrying out that analysis, it is, it is these banks, right? So if, if, some of the, if some of the quantitative and analytical ingenuity that goes into formulating the trading strategies and the market risk processing were to be applied to this problem, um, it's hard to believe that you couldn't do a better job of scrutinising what your people are up to. I think you're absolutely right, Rolly. The, the banks have a dilemma, though, because on the one hand, uh, they're, they're dealing with very, very capable, intelligent, mm. professional people, and they want to manage them in that sort of mm. way. On the other hand, there, there is this risk that these people could be doing something that, mm. that, that's untoward. So it's quite a dilemma, and, you, and I think the, the people at the top find that very difficult to work mm. out where to go with it. Um, but given that the, we're dealing with quite small numbers of people, and given that these people are really very well paid, it's not that much to say, well, actually, in return for the privileges that go with mm. that role, actually, you're going to have to, have to uh, uh, undertake some um, unpleasant things like being scrutinised a bit more. It's actually how it used to work in banking. Uh, when I first started, we ran staff accounts, and therefore we could see what people were doing, and people were restricted in where they could bank, they were restricted in where they could trade on personal account and so on. And it was, it was kind of something you accepted as the price of having a job with, with that opportunity and privilege. So something that used to be accepted in banking, and I guess Bill is accepted in other industries and other sectors. Yes, uh, just talking about uh, the national security uh, environment for a moment um, and across government. Uh, government assets, uh, national assets, are classed according to essentially the damage that could be caused were those assets to be compromised to the nation. Uh, and uh, to give you an example, a top secret definition, one of the definitions is causing uh, uh, massive economic damage to the UK. Uh, well in this time of extreme uh, financial fragility, uh, not just to the UK but to Europe and the world, uh, the consequence that could arrive from uh, causing a bank, a bank to collapse uh, with the potential knock-on effect from uh, a catastrophic loss. Uh, and we seem to be continuing to read about traders who appear to be able to get away with that. Um, seems to me to at least raise the question, uh, is there a case for stronger vetting for those, as Stephen was saying a little bit earlier, who have the access to assets that 
if their damage could cause massive economic damage. Mm. And I think it's also, uh, and I, I, I think a lot of those points are very valid. I mean, I think it's also important to focus on the individuals who really do, who really are in a position to cause these losses. There's been a lot of focus in recent years on very senior people in, in banks from a point of view of their remuneration and, and, and you know, other, uh, other factors. Actually, um, this gentleman and previous, previous uh, rogue traders have not been at hugely senior executive levels within the institution, and yet they're capable of, of, of introducing losses probably greater than what most people in the C-suite could do. Um, and, you know, so I think we, we, we do need to think about the level in which, in which these monitoring activities are carried out within the bank. Can I just add one point to build on Rollo's, Rollo's, Rollo's point there? Um, to me, the point of... Uh, um, considering and potentially introducing some form of enhanced vetting for those who have access to those, those assets uh, is to um, uh, not in any sense, in any sense, uh, be uh, a big brother or a negative element. What it is absolutely about is uh, building confidence, building trust, uh, not just in, in shareholders and in, in the public, but actually building confidence and trust among the employees that this won't happen in our bank. It's part of what the bank as a business brings mm -hmm. to all their customers and stakeholders table. Mm. We, we are a bank that can be counted on where these things won't happen. We will drive down opportunistic crime uh, because people will see that actually it's not worth the risk because it will be detected and therefore I won't, it won't even cross my mind. I will always err on doing the right thing. It's a cultural approach. Mm. And I'd, and I'd be pretty sure. I mean, and, and I think I, I think Stephen touched on this point earlier. Of course, these institutions, these are these are very valuable employees to the firm. And of course, people are, are nervous about alienating their employees with intrusive, snooping type behaviour, um, you know, and causing them to go elsewhere. But um, I, I'd be pretty sure that, that that most employees at UBS who've just seen their bonus pool probably yeah. depleted, if not eliminated for the year would and quite happily have submitted a to a level back. of, of yes. monitoring. Yeah, well, mm. indeed. Mm. So, you know. But I, I'm not sure these people go elsewhere, because if all banks um, take yeah. a vigilant approach, there isn't anywhere else to go. Um, and you, you kind of, after a while, after a lot of complaining, you accept it as being part of the job, mm. in the same way that, for example, in the US, um, the SEC does drug testing mm -hmm. uh, for people for registration. We don't do that in the UK. But in the US, it's kind of accepted that that's what mm. you have to do if you want to be a banker. Mm. Do you, think it, do you think that type of regime is something that can be introduced by individual institutions or do we need some kind of regulatory mandate or driver to, to get that? I suspect the institutions will say that they need some help from outside mm. because um, it is quite a difficult thing to do in isolation mm. uh, in what are very competitive markets. Mm. But um, as you say, given the, um, the reaction of, of the other people at UBS who've, who've mm. lost their bonuses for the year, um, mm. you might find there's quite a lot of support for it inside mm. the organisation. Mm. I do think, and, and, and clearly it's difficult, but I do think it, it, it is important to think about how we can create a culture where it's possible for people at an earlier stage in the process, when they've made a bad error of judgment, um, they're in a hole, to come forward and, 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 and get the situation out in the open before such an enormous and catastrophic loss is built up. Because, um, you know, clearly this could have been, this could have been um, identified earlier and a great deal of money could have been saved and potentially a, a potentially systemically destabilising event could have been avoided. I think it's very difficult. I mean, the other industries that do it would be airlines or mm -hmm. medicine, where you have anonymous um, lines where people can go in and say, well, I had a near miss and this is mm. what happened, or I had this problem with mm. surgery and this is what happened. Um, I think the difference here is not that people have performed badly and therefore need mm -hmm. to own up to poor performance. It's where somebody's actually broken rules, where they've broken the trading limits. Yeah. It's much more difficult to say to somebody who's broken a trading limit, oh, well, we can forgive and forget. Yeah. Um, if they've made a genuine mistake, mm. then I think you can, you, you can do that. And certainly I've seen that happen in the city where yeah. people, they, they may take a hit on a bonus that year, but yeah. actually as long as they pick themselves up, yeah. dust themselves down, they can, they can yeah. resume. I mean, one wonders whether some proportion of these incidents start off with someone making a legitimate Could mistake be. and being in the hole and then this you know yes th this pattern develops as a you know. it's a doubling yeah. up of the bet yeah. almost isn't it yes in the sort of pressured environment of the trading floor it's quite often potentially difficult to get a good perspective on how serious an error is and if there were opportunities for people to speak to some kind of mental role somebody who was slightly outside the organization perhaps there would be a space for them to realise when the errors were small enough to make a recovery from and give people an early out rather than continuing the doubling up and seeing a repeat of what we've seen here.
I, I think all I, I think given given the scale of the sort of disastrous situations that these that these kind of incidents can lead to, as we've seen in recent days, I think that. This is an angle that needs to be explored alongside other ones. I think it's, it's, it's worth leaving no stone unturned here. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you.